and uh, welcome to the uh, first seminar of 2021. Uh, so those of you who are new to this uh, session, this is a uh, ongoing uh, seminar series uh, organized by several scholars here at the University of Toronto, including myself, uh, Christopher Beck, uh, Tracy Galloway, uh, Laura Rossello and Michael Widener. Uh, we're a fairly eclectic group coming from a variety of disciplines at the University of Toronto, including uh, the School of Public Health, uh, Anthropology, Mechanical Industrial Engineering, uh, Geography and Planning, as well as the Center for Critical Development Studies. And uh, it's a, it basically it's a group of scholars in which we are broadly interested in exploring the theme of building resilience in food and health supply chains. And it's a seminar series we started last semester uh, with a series of presentations. You can see recordings of those on our website, which is available through the uh, School of Cities of the University of Toronto. Um, and here we are continuing into 2021. Now, as I had mentioned, uh, we have, um, well, well I'll, I'll get to this in just a moment here. Um, and if you look in that website as well, we do have a number of schedules or rather seminars lined up uh, for the coming semester. Uh, for instance, next week we'll have uh, Louis Martin Rousseau, uh, from, who's a professor at the Polytechnique Montreal, uh, talking about uh, improving the efficiency of cancer treatment through predictive and prescriptive analytics. Um, in subsequent weeks, we have Mark Fox, who will be speaking about uh, measuring supply chain performance, and uh, Professor Megan Katsumi on the understanding of transportation data with ontologies. Um, and several other uh, speakers lined up, many of them looking at uh, issues of community resilience, health system resilience, uh, resilience with agricultural systems, uh, race and urban food systems, as well as food systems within Canada, and uh, many dealing with uh, supply chain logistics as well. So it's a fairly, as I say, eclectic group, but we're all revolving around this theme of resilience within food and health supply chains. Um, today, we're fortunate to have uh, the real lead of this project, whether indeed five of us are contributing. Uh, Professor Christopher Beck has arguably, well, has unquestionably been uh, the lead throughout this process. Um, professor Beck is a professor in the Department of Mechanical and Industrial Engineering at the University of Toronto. And his research uh, uses the development of math and algorithms, as well as tools of operations research and artificial intelligence uh, to solve a wide range of problems. Uh, most of his work focuses upon scheduling in one form or another, um, particularly looking at how to allocate resources over time to achieve a variety of goals including the efficient delivery of packages, uh, the production of goods, as well as the provisioning of services. Uh, Chris has served as the president of the Executive Council for the International Conference on Automated Planning and Scheduling. Um, looking over that website today, it looks like he's uh, been in the unusual role of holding that position for multiple years. Um, he's also, uh, this month, he assumed the role of being the president of the Association for Constraint Planning. Uh, Professor Beck has more than 140, very impressive, uh, peer-reviewed publications in international journals and uh, in conferences, and he supervised more than 40 graduate students. Uh, so I'm very excited to be hearing from Chris today, learning more about his research. As you can see from the title on his slide here, his presentation is entitled Supply Chain Optimization and Operations Research Perspective. So uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with this seminar series, uh, the presenter usually speaks for approximately 40 minutes, and then we have the remaining 15 minutes or so to have discussion and question and answer, which can be done in the chat uh, box, but preferably uh, voiced uh, here on the screen. So uh, without further ado, I'll turn the time over to you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan, and, and thanks for the introduction. Um, so this is the first talk of the semester and also kind of the first talk from an engineering perspective. Um, and the, ne the next few weeks are all going to be on the side of sort of computer science operations research. And so what I thought I'd do is give kind of an overview of uh, an a particular engineering style approach to supply chain optimization. And that's the, the operations research world. 
Um, I'm going to try to give kind of an overview of, of what operations research is with some examples of, of the work I've done uh, over the past few years to kind of kind of make it uh, concrete. And so without further ado, I'll see if I can start. All right, so this is from the INFORMS website. And so INFORMS is basically the uh, United States uh, National Society for Operations Research, but it's also probably one of the largest ones in the world. And their definition is that operations research is a discipline that deals with the application of advanced analytical methods to help make better decisions. And they then go on to list a whole bunch of the advanced analytical methods that, uh, that actually go into operations research from simulation, mathematical optimization, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's quite a wide set of tools. And we have arguments within operations research about whether, you know, is it better to try to emphasize tools? Is it better to emphasize applications? And really what happens is people are all over the place. Some people are really applications oriented. Some people are really tools oriented. And one of the ways that I want to get into this um, is to start talking about what it, it means to have a mathematical model. Because underlying almost all of these uh, approaches is some sort of modeling technique where we take a decision-making problem, we represent it mathematically in some sort of framework and use the tools of that framework then to come up with an answer, come up with a solution or maybe a series of decisions. Um, and then hopefully that series of decisions can actually be used in some way back in the original problem world. Um, and so what I wanna start doing is introduce at a very basic level um, what we kind of mean by a mathematical model. And so I'm starting with what you see here on the left, which is a graph. Um, these circles are called nodes and these lines between the nodes are called edges. I've numbered the nodes one to five and I've also put on this, uh, this other number attached to each node um, which we're going to call the weight of the node. So it's just some sort of piece of data that's associated with a node. And this is obvious, this is a mathematical model. It's very abstracted at this point, but mathematicians and computer scientists have defined what's called a maximum independent set problem. And the way you might want to think about this is perhaps each of these nodes represents a meeting. The weights of these nodes, so for example, the five here, represents the importance of holding this meeting. And the edges connecting two of these nodes indicate that there's an overlap in the attendees to this meeting. And so if we're given one meeting slot and we want to maximize the number of meetings we can actually hold, what we mean we want, what we want to do is we want to pick the set of edges that we can simultaneously you hold a meeting. So the set of meetings that we can do at the same time, maximizing, for example, the sum of these weights. And so that's an example of what's called a maximum independent set problem. And so what I wanna get across is I've done something here where I've taken, I've kind of done it backwards, but I've taken a problem of trying to understand how to schedule a set of meetings and made the mathematical model of a graph Right, where I've represented the aspects of this problem in a graph. And then typically I make one more step right, and actually formulate this in a set of mathematical tools that I can solve. And so what I've shown you here is an integer programming formulation. I've introduced a set of variables, x1 to x5, that correspond to the nodes in my graph. And the idea is I'm going to assign x1 equals one if I've selected the meeting. And so what I'm doing here is actually representing this maximum independent set problem as an integer program. So what I'm trying to do is maximize this expression. And so this is the weights of the meetings. And I've got a series of constraints here that tell me I can't have x1 and x2 because x1 and x2 share an edge. And so I can't actually choose both of those. And so given this mathematical, this integer programming representation, what I can then do is I can then throw this off into a solver. One of the areas of, of computer science and operations research that has built up over the past 50 to 70 years is actually solvers that can take problems given a particular mathematical framework um, and deliver a solution. In this case, this solution is gonna be a set of values to my 
xi variables that will maximize this objective function. And so there are a number of commercial solvers that can take integer programs um, of actually surprisingly large size and very quickly give us a solution to this problem. So in terms of the broad scope of OR, it really goes everywhere from, from very basic mathematical research where we're really interested in some of the, the mathematical objects that are, for, for example, induced by a mathematical model. Um, what are the possible characteristics of those models? What can we say about those mathematical objects? All the way down to the other end of actually deploying models in the real world. And if you look at the INFORMS website, they've actually have a, an annual prize um, where they award prizes for the best application of operations research. And there's a variety of, of large international organizations that submit their, act, their applications. These are actually being used in practice to, for example, schedule the trains in the Netherlands as, as one example of a recent winner. It also spans everywhere in between from the, the very abstracted math um, to building computer algorithms, to building solvers, to building models for particular problems. And my research tends to, to fit in the middle, more or less. I'm not really into the very mathematical side of things, and I haven't really gone into actually deploying uh, the models. But a lot of what my students do and a lot of what my research is, is building the models, trying to understand if we can solve the interesting, uh, solve these models. If not, we have to go into the solvers and algorithms and try to understand if we can improve those algorithms so that we can build the models. And we end up having kind of a, a cycle between the model building and the algorithm uh, building. What I wanted to do is I wanted to focus mostly on, actually entirely on building models in this talk. Um, and I'm gonna start to, by talking about a, a senior transportation or the senior transportation problem, which is a problem that one of my students worked on, one of my master's students worked on a few years ago. And I think it's appropriate for, for this audience because it sort of gets to some of the things that we've been talking about um, in terms of healthcare um, and, and other aspects of the supply chain, even though it's purely in a, cert, in a, in a service setting. And so, this problem starts with an organization that uh, my graduate student Chang Lu contacted uh, called CHATS. And so CHATS is an organization that covers an area north of Toronto, a quite a large area north of Toronto, and it provides transportation services for seniors. And one of the things I learned when I started doing this research is in the city of Toronto, there are probably a dozen such organizations that provide transportation for people who aren't, um, who, who have some mobility, maybe not enough mobility to go in the standard public transit, um, but also mobile enough so that they're not eligible for the wheel trans service that, for example, the Toronto Transit Commission runs. And so there are a number of mostly volunteer charitable organizations in different communities in Toronto that will run that will provide the service of transportation. And this is transportation from everything to a, uh, whoops, everything to a uh, doctor's appointment, to a hairdresser's, to going down to a uh, community center to spend some time at a community center. And what happens is many of these providers of the service are actually volunteers. So volunteers who have their own vehicles, who are willing to spend two hours on a Tuesday afternoon to make a few uh, pickups and drop-offs of people, um, and then they're going to go on with the rest of their day. And so this organization, Chats, came to us and said, well, we've got a whole lot of trips that we're providing every year. Not all of the trips, um, we can't schedule, we can't actually meet the demand. So about 4% of the trips were not met in the data that they gave us. And in many cases, 85% of the cases, the vehicles were not used at full capacity. And so what they were wondering was, is there a way that we can uh, use some of the tools of operations research to understand how to better schedule their volunteer drivers to be able to do these pickups and drop-offs? And so what we did is we, we developed a formal problem definition and then a number of mathematical models. And so here's a schematic version where we have 
you know, pickups and we have starting depots and ending depots. So this is the idea that somebody might be on their way to work, but willing to spend a couple of hours on their way to work to do some of these deliveries. Um, and so we have to decide which of these requests, so this is a plus as a pickup, a minus as a drop off. Each of these requests has a weight, some importance. So probably a, a visit to a, um, to a doctor is gonna be more important than a visit to, the, for a, to a groceries, for example. They've got a load size, meaning a number of people, perhaps also is there a walker or a wheelchair that has to be part of this trip and time windows, because obviously if there are appointments involved, there are times that the uh, person wants to be at their location and times that they need to be picked up. A vehicle has capacity and a vehicle has a time window in which it's available. And so what we need to do, given that we have the starting and ending locations of our volunteers and these pickup and drop off locations of the seniors who want to have transportation is we need to decide which of the requests we're able to satisfy. Hopefully we can satisfy them all, but we're going to try to maximize the weight of the uh, requests that we can satisfy. We're going to need to figure out how to assign these requests to vehicles and how to route the vehicles. So the vehicles have to begin at their starting place and end at their ending place. And they have to actually pick up and drop off people. Obviously people have to be picked up before they're dropped off and you cannot overcapacitate the vehicle so that you can't have too many people in your vehicle. Other interesting constraints that we had, right, was that this is a multi-depot because the volunteer drivers are starting and ending in different locations, the restricted capacity and time window. And given that we're transporting people, we had an upper limit on the ride time. We don't want somebody to be spending three hours in a car in what could be a half an hour trip if it was a direct trip. And so there was also this upper bound. One of the things that made this very different from standard vehicle routing problems, and this is a vehicle routing problem, is that we had a very restricted capacity. Many of these vehicles were personal cars that could hit, fit two, three people in them. And most of the formal work on vehicle routing problems are in a much more commercial setting where we have 12, 15, 25 people in terms of the capacity. And if we put it into things like cargo, um, we have a, even a much larger capacity uh, on our vehicles. And so what seemed to be very different about this is this very small, very restricted capacity of our vehicles. So what we did is we developed a number of mathematical models. And so on the left here, you see four different mathematical models that are combining tools from uh, operations research, mixed energy programming and from constraint programming. And then the bottom two are a more sophisticated combination of those models. And then on the right here, this was less of a mathematical model and more of a, a heuristic that we coded up to try to come up with a good solution, but not necessarily the best solution. And I'm not gonna go into those details, but the idea is that the, the quite, uh, talented master students spent a lot of time trying to understand how to come up with mathematical models that would best represent this problem, that we could solve it in a reasonable amount of time. Just to give you an idea of how the overall master's thesis was set up, we generated a number of problem instances where we had different locations, different numbers of vehicles, and different number of requests. We also looked at time window size, um, because if there's narrower windows, they're going to be harder to to satisfy. And we had 280 real world instances. So these were the actual requests that chats had on 280 different days during the year that they gave us. And you can see that they are much larger in terms of the number of vehicles and the number of requests. Um, and we had 20 or 30 vehicles with large windows, others with small, um, and all the requests had, had small time windows. And so this set on the left was really used for us to generate our models to play with them, to test them out. Um, and then the ones on the left were used to try to understand, could we scale to these real world problems? And I'm just gonna go through this briefly. Uh, this is a, a graph where the bars correspond to the right hand axis. And this is the number of the problems uh, of our made up data that we could solve to optimality. That is we could find a maximum weight schedule and prove that it was the maximum weight schedule. And then this orange uh, line corresponds to their right hand, 
uh, which is the, the actual average runtime of solving these instances. And so with constraint programming, we were able to actually find optimal solutions for all these problems in a, a very short amount of time. Uh, and in fact, a short enough amount of time that this could be something that people could use in practice. And interestingly, one of the research results here was that these more complicated techniques, uh, which we expected to do better, weren't actually performing better than a more uh, basic technique. Of course, where it really hits the road is when we think some about some uh, real instances. And so what we showed with constraint programming is that we could solve 90% of them to prove an optimality. Um, and we were within about 3% of the optimal solution for the other problems. And our runtime was about 126 seconds here. And so there's a lot of details and I don't wanna really get down to the, the low level here, but I just wanted to give you an example of a type of, uh, a type of problem and a type of process that we go through uh, for a paper that's published in, in the world that I work in um, and a master's thesis in the world that I work in. Now, great, so we've solved these problems. It's a challenge in, in my research and often some of my colleagues do this much better than I do um, that often I get a paper and we get some nice results, but we have problems closing the loop. In this application-oriented place, application-oriented project, we wanted to then go back to chats, go back to the organization and understand, can we actually take the, the algorithms and models that we've developed and solve their problem better, right? And in practice, so that people who aren't, don't have PhDs in optimization can actually use these tools in their day-to-day -day, uh, operations of their business. And the problem is that it's often the case that a small, especially for a small company, they don't have the technology to take, to absorb our research. Um, and we're not professional software developers. We don't have the abilities to actually build a production ready piece of software that people are going to be able to take into their business and use reliably to, for example, schedule their trips, okay? Sometimes it's easier with a larger company or an organization because they have engineers and researchers that do the span between research and application. Um, but in many cases, we do some research and we have the problem with that last step of how do we get this actually being used um, in, our, in the real world. Curiously, in this case, um, after all this happened, another student of mine successfully graduated with a PhD and then went to work for a small startup company who was doing deliveries. So this is your you know, bicycle delivery Uber Eats style. Um, and he realized that the model that we had developed for the senior transportation problem was exactly what they could use uh, to schedule the deliveries on the bicycle couriers. And so in a very strange way, uh, this did make it to industry. This did actually begin being used um, because through a startup company that I had nothing to do with, um, the, uh, the technology we had developed for one problem got deployed uh, in a quite a different problem. And so, I don't know, I say that's, Kind of, a, kind of a success story, but not necessarily the, the success story I'd like to, to tell about the original problem. All right, so given that kind of dive into a particular problem, I wanna jump back and say that operations research solves an awful lot of problems within the supply chain or has been applied to an awful lot of problems within the supply chain. Everything from forecasting to scheduling to inventory management, and it really follows this idea of developing a mathematical model for some circumscribed part of the problem or even for a more general high level model of a large part of the supply chain. And often there are different models at different levels of abstraction and these models can communicate with each other. But there's a wide, wide space of literature in supply chain management within the, the area of operations research and indeed more widely for example, within the areas of, of artificial intelligence. Now, George Box was a, a well-known statistician and he's famous for saying that all models are wrong, but some are useful. And this is something that, that I come up against increasingly as I think about the work I'm doing um, that, and, and even more as I think about the work, uh, the, the seminars that we've been doing over the past 
uh, over the past semester. All models are wrong, but some are useful. And I'm thinking about you know, the problems of the supply chain as they are understood um, by public health people, as they are understood by geographers. And I'm trying to understand, are there models that we can build with, with my tools um, that are useful? Right? What are the questions that are being asked in other areas? And are there actually tools within my area that can, can say something useful about the questions people are asking? And we have two problems. Can we build models that are useful? Meaning, can we take some messy, ugly problem and actually get it down to some sort of mathematical model that we can understand, um, that we can represent? It's a very reductive process, or it's a very, we're going to abstract away a, a whole lot of the real world aspects of it. And as we've done that, is the model actually even useful anymore? If we can do that, we actually have another problem, and that is ultimately we have to try to solve these models, right? Either it's giving it to a commercial solver, building our own solvers, and there's actually a, a fatal flaw uh, in the world, in fact, when we ask about solving these problems. And so what I wanna talk about is briefly the limits of, of computation. And so there's a question I ask my fourth year class on scheduling, is there a mathematically specified problem whose solution cannot be computed? Is there a problem that you can give me that there does not exist, theoretically, there does not exist any way to answer the problem? And this is actually the answer is yes. There's a, a famous problem called the halting problem, which essentially says, can I know that a given algorithm is going to halt with an answer or is going to execute forever? And it was shown by, by Turing uh, in about the 1930s, I believe, that in fact, this is a problem for which there is no algorithmic solution to answer the problem. So this, fine, this creates a class of undecidable problems where we can get to a point where a mathematically well-defined problem cannot actually be answered by computation, okay? I'm more interested in something a bit more prosaic, which is, is there a problem whose solution can be computed, but in fact takes way too much time? So theoretically, how hard are the problems that we wanna solve? And are they all easy? Are they all hard? Are there some that are easy or some that are hard? How do we understand from a computational perspective, the difficulty of a computational problem? And so this leads to a, a famous uh, millennium challenge that is known as P versus NP. So loosely P are these problems that can be solved that are easy problems as mathematicians have defined them. And NP are, are problems such that we don't actually know if there exists an easy solution to these problems. And what I wanna do is I wanna give you a bit more of an insight as to, to what that actually means, okay? So I've given you here a list of, what is that? Eight numbers, okay? And what I want to do is I want to sort these numbers in ascending order. So I've got n integers, in this case n is 8. In the worst case, how many pairwise comparisons of integers do I have to do? Pairwise comparisons and swaps, moving them around, to actually end up with a list of numbers that's ordered in ascending order. And so the answer here is we can show that there exist algorithms that in the worst case, so nature can give me the absolute worst particular list of n integers, can solve the problem in n times log n operations. So we've got a list of n integers and we can actually find a solution with only n times n log operations. And in the case of sorting n numbers, it can be proved that you cannot do it with fewer such operations. So there does not exist an algorithm that's guaranteed to sort a set of numbers um, in less than n log n operations. Okay, and now I've got given you another graph and this is an example of what's called the traveling salesman problem. So here, each of these nodes represents a city. The weight is now on the arc, on the edge between the cities. And the question is, in the worst case, how many computational operations do you need to find the shortest route 
that visits all n nodes. Okay, and in this case, there are currently no algorithms that will guarantee to be found to find an optimal solution in the worst case in less than two n operations. Okay, and so n now is in the exponent here, and in fact, this is an example of a problem that is in NP. This is an NP complete problem. Okay, and the big open question in computer theory is, are these questions that are NP complete, are they actually a different set than the problems that are in P? So does P equal NP is an open question. We don't know if we're just not smart enough to come up with an algorithm that can solve this problem where N is with a number of uh, operations is polynomial in N. But right now we have no example of an algorithm that's better than order n, order two to the n in the worst case. So what does that mean? Now, again, I have problems trying to figure out how big numbers are. And so what I've done is I've listed n here. Don't worry about this O notation. That's just something that computer scientists use. This is the number of uh, operations. If I have n equal one, I can sort a, a set of numbers with one number with zero operations. Obviously it's already sorted, right? And so if, if the algorithm takes n log n and I get up to a thousand, well, I can do that with 3000 operations. If it takes n squared and I get up to a thousand problem size of a thousand, it's a million. When I put n in the exponent, well, I'm already up to a thousand if n is equal to 10. If n is equal to 50, I'm up to, what's that 1.1 million, billion, trillion, quadrillion. Um, and if it's a thousand, I'm up to 1.07 times 10 to the 301, um, which again, doesn't really mean anything to me um, because I have no idea what that number means. But one way to do it is to think about the number of seconds in the universe so far, the world's fastest supercomputer today. And let's say I've got something that's 10 to the 17 times faster than the world's fastest supercomputer it would still take me 10 to the 249 times longer than the age of the universe to solve this problem. So the TSP with a thousand cities is going to take me a ridiculously number, a ridiculously number of times the length of the universe to actually solve. So what you should be thinking of then is this doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? because I've told you that operations research spends a lot of time solving these problems. And the issue is that this is in the worst case, right? So in many cases, we can come up with a solution to a traveling salesman problem, a solution to a vehicle routing problem, a solution to a scheduling problem in a reasonable amount of time. And in fact, most of my research is about developing algorithms, approaches, and models for solving these computationally challenging problems, okay? However, eventually we're gonna lose, right? There is always going to be instances of our problem that take too long to solve in practice. And we're going to have to fall back on, well, I'm not sure on saying, no, there's no solution and saying, oh, well, this is an okay solution. I'm not really sure how good it is, but maybe it's something you can use. Um, but sometimes depending upon the formulation of the problem, we can't even find a solution of any quality um, in, we're not guaranteed to find such a solution in a reasonable amount of time. And so this is kind of one of these tragedies of the universe um, that there is this mathematical representation of problems that means we're not gonna succeed all the time. And so we have this problem of, can we, represent the problem such that it, an answer to this problem is actually going to be useful. And if we can, can we actually solve them? And in both cases, happily, it's not never, but the answer is sometimes. Sometimes we can solve such problems. Sometimes we can model such problems um, and put them together to actually do something useful. So I want to talk briefly about resilience since this is the underlying topic of our seminar series and talk about how operations research people tend to, has tended to talk about resilience within supply chain and within the parts of the supply chain, such as scheduling and routing. And so 
The answer is, well, if there's some uncertainty in the problem, we're going to model it. Um, we're going to just stick it into our mathematical model, and we're going to reason about that uncertainty as we model it. Okay, and so here are, there are a variety of approaches, but fundamentally many of them come down to, to the following. We've got some decisions here, so we can make decision A, B, or C. And we've got different scenarios about how the world might work itself out, okay? And what I'm showing you here is the cost of making decision A if scenario one is actually how the world works out, okay? So it's 123 cost units, whatever that means, okay? And what we typically do, given some sort of space of solutions and space of scenarios, is we try to minimize some sort of probabilistic measure of the cost of that decision. Maybe it's going to be the expected value. Um, we're trying to, on average, come up with our best solution we can. Maybe we're risk averse, and we actually want to minimize the maximum cost, right? So we're worried about their maximum cost, and we want to find make a decision that minimizes our maximum. Or maybe there's other moments of our distribution that we're worried about. We can minimize the 95th percentile cost or something like that. Now, the problem with this is, in fact, we actually have an exponential number of decisions to make, right? So these decisions are, for example, what is the route that my vehicle should take? And maybe my scenarios have to do with the traffic on the different routes, okay? And so, in fact, there's also potentially an exponential number of scenarios of different ways that the world might work itself out. And so now we're not only worried about exponential in one direction, trying to find a set of solutions in this very large space, we also have to worry about exponential in another direction um, to try to deal with the possible ways that the world can work itself out. And this adds another layer of difficulty to the computation that we're trying to do. I'm going to talk about, uh, let's see, with the time I have left, I think I can probably talk about all three of these briefly. Um, and so what I want to do is talk about a couple of pieces of work I've done. The first one is about locating warehouses and trying to decide the fleet size, so the number of trucks that we might give to a, a warehouse, given that we have uncertain travel times. The second one has to do with scheduling with uncertain durations, so we don't know exactly how long it's going to take to produce a particular part or to do a step in a production process. And then I'm going to talk about some work that uh, that's due to some other people that is looking at how do we determine what factories should allocate, should produce which products, given that there's some uncertain demand for the products. And so again, I'm just going to kind of give you a flavor of these problems um, and touch briefly upon the solutions, but not go into, into deep detail. So this problem is the following. I have a bunch of potential locations that I could open um, as a warehouse, or actually as originally uh, motivated, these were recycling locations. So what we wanted to do was in an urban setting, where were the best places to actually build recycling locations? We're gonna make, we wanna make that decision subject to the fact that we have customers. We have customers that are located geographically. And what we're gonna do is we're going to assign each customer after we select uh, our locations, we want to assign each customer to one of these locations. And then we want to decide each of these boxes represents a truck, okay? How big a fleet do we actually place on each of the, at each of these locations so that they can do a round trip tour to go to, a, go to a customer, pick up their recycling and return to the recycling depot. Given that in a given day, we have a limit on the travel time that each truck can uh, can spend. And so that travel time is uncertain because in an urban situation, we're dealing with traffic. And so what we want to do is we want to try to figure out how we can make these long-term decisions, these strategic decisions that require us to build a location to do recycling, a tactical level decision that assigns a, a vehicle, sorry, assigns a customer to a location. And then again, a tactical level decision that says, well, how many vehicles are we going to place at each of these locations? Finally, then it's going to be the low level operational decision about how we allocate trucks to individual customers. 
And without going into too much detail, what I wanted to show you was kind of the overall approach that we took on this. We, we solved a series of models. So each of these boxes is actually a mathematical model. And these models are creating solutions and communicating with each other. So we had an upper level model that looked at the expected value location allocation problem. So we chose locations and assigned customers to maximize the expectation of the quality of the solution we're going to get out. We then had a lower level decision to assign vehicles to each of our open facilities. And then finally, we calculated the penalty for the extra travel time given a particular scenario that might play itself out. And so what we ended up doing was having communication back amongst all these models to try to handle um, the overall approach to solving this problem. And it worked reasonably well. Um, we got a, a nice journal publication out of it, but it ends up being very complicated to try to orchestrate this three level decomposition amongst these problems. And so ultimately it sort of became more complicated than, than I wanted in terms of trying to, to get some very nice uh, understanding of, of an approach to such complicated problems. Second approach was in a very abstracted job shop scheduling problem. And so what we have here, so job shop scheduling is the, is the fruit fly of the scheduling world. Everyone works in the job shop scheduling problem. We have this thing that's a job, okay? A job is a series of operations. And so you can think of an operation as actually doing some sort of production step on a machine, right? We're uh, cutting out the leather to make some shoes, for example. These arrows are presence constraints. And so what this actually means is that, right, a particular operation here, this green operation can't start until the preceding red operation has completed. Each operation requires a unit of a resource and I've color coded the resources. So there's a red resource, a green resource and a blue one. And each resource has only a capacity of one. And so what we're gonna try to do, okay, is decide the order of each of these operations on each resource such that these presence constraints are satisfied. And I've only drawn in one presence constraint. I've drawn the presence constraint from that top job here. And what I wanna do is I wanna minimize the total amount of time it takes to schedule all of these operations. Now I add some uncertainty and it might be the case that I don't actually know how long my operation is gonna take with certainty. I might have some probability distribution, maybe with a mean and a standard deviation that tells me how long these operations are going to take. And so under that situation, what I wanna do is I want to develop a minimum make span. So I wanna find the make span or the, the value D such that the probability that my make span is less than D is 99%, for example, right? So now I'm into the world of actually trying to solve stochastic scheduling problems. And one of the interesting aspects of this is remember how I talked about problems for which it was uh, hard to find a solution. The catch here is if you gave me a solution, simply evaluating how good that solution is, is itself computationally hard. So in some ways, this is doubly computationally difficult. Finding a solution is hard and even evaluating the quality of that solution is hard. And so this was a, a paper that we looked at or a problem that we looked at in, in a paper to try to understand how we could use some combination of mixed integer programming and simulation to, to derive a solution to this problem. And I'm not gonna go into that anymore. The final one I th find, I think is a, quite an interesting paper. Um, it's a very well-known paper in operations research and it's looking at the issue of assigning production locations. And so the idea is I've got multiple factories and I've got multiple products. And I want to understand, is it worthwhile to have a given factory produce multiple products or should each factory only produce one, okay? That is, is it worthwhile to have some process flexibility given that there's some uncertainty to, into the demand of my product? And so if I have a factory that can do two things and it turns out that one of them is in high demand and one of them is low demand, well, it can 
change its production so that it's going to satisfy the one with high demand more than the low demand. It's got that flexibility. And so what we can look at is a spectrum. On one side, every factory can produce every product. Okay, this is the most flexible way to do things, but it's actually going to be very costly because the physical infrastructure of the factory is going to have to be developed so that every factory can schedule everything. The other extreme, every factory can have one product. Okay, in this case, it's going to be cheap in terms of the infrastructure, but our uncertainty is going to be high. If I have a very low demand for this product, this factory is either going to be idle because there's nothing to sell, or it's going to be building inventory that we don't know if we're ever going to be able to sell. Okay. It turns out that somewhere in the middle um, is what's called the long chain pattern. And there's a fair amount of mathematical underpinnings to this. There's reasons uh, given the way that this works out to be the best way to do things. There's also a significant amount of empirical evidence that this works out very well. And it's this way of balancing it such that each product makes two things, sorry, each factory makes two things, but each product is also made by two factories. And the long chain is the fact that you can follow this around and it eventually links back up. And it turns out, and again, there's been a series of papers that talked about the math underlying this, that this representation has to do with uh, the maximum marginal gain of adding a new production, uh, adding the ability to produce a product at a factory. The maximum marginal gain is exactly when you've closed this long loop. Um, and so there's some very nice math that underlies why this is a good representation in terms of balancing cost and, uh, and the, uh, the uncertainty. All right, I can see I've run over time. Um, and so I want to want to finish it up, but I want to actually make a final comment um, that says in the context of what we've been talking about in this seminar series, what I worry about is given the work that people are doing in, in public health and geography and in healthcare services, are there tools within operations research that can be used to, to represent these, these very rich problems? If there are, can we solve them? And a third challenge, which I mentioned that I have, are there communities, are there organizations that can actually absorb the uh, research we've done so that whatever we come up with can actually be used uh, to solve the problems in practice? And with that, I think I'll end. Thank you, Chris. That was a fascinating talk, very interesting. Um, I can see a couple of questions have already come up in the chat box here. We have um, I, we have one from Laura and one from Tracy. Uh, I, would you two like to ask those verbally or would you like to, I can obviously read them for you if you'd like. Uh, Laura, uh, sure, yeah, I'm happy to okay. ask. Um, great, great talk, Chris. I just find it so fascinating. I wish I could take your class. <laughs> I think I would. Uh, that's what. That's my main takeaway. Uh, I just think this is so useful, and I think that there's to to answer your question, there's so many tools that might be useful if we can translate them effectively across disciplines. So my main question is that part around, you know, you had a slide talking about well, you could do this if you're if you wanted cost, you do that way. There's all these different things. I find that we struggle a lot articulating what we're trying to optimize. Um, we don't have that debate about saying, okay, before we start implementing a bunch of strategies, let's actually all talk about the pros and cons of optimizing this versus that. Are there tools to facilitate that discussion or, um, cause that's almost a values or I don't know what discussion that has to happen first. And then once you do that, then you have the math and the problems to solve it. So I just wondered your perspective on, I think that would be hugely useful. So, so I think it's, this is a really important aspect, right? This is the, what I've called the, so there's something we call modeling, mathematical modeling, which is usually taking a well-defined problem and coming up with a mixed integer programming model or a constraint programming model. There's a step before this, which I've called the problem definition problem, which is taking this ugly real world thing where we're not really sure what we're optimizing, where different stakeholders think we should be optimizing different things and trying to come up with some sort of agreement 
on what we want to optimize, what are the constraints of our problem? And, and there are some tools um, that, that sort of feed into this. A lot of the, the operations research is almost starting too late. It's starting assuming that somebody can give us uh, optimization function and how to solve it. And, and I think it's really important that trying to understand how to define the problem, the impact of that definition, both on an ability to solve, to come up with a reasonable answer, but also on the, on the fact that that answer is actually gonna mean anything back in the real world um, is, is a, a really hard problem. Um, there are some techniques, so, you know, systems dynamics is, a, is an approach that, in fact, one of my graduate students is investigating for some of the work that, uh, that we're doing in, in collaboration with Tracy to try to understand the picture of the system, what are the aspects of the system that are actually relevant, and, um, but, but sort of the, the work I'm doing as part of the seminar series is pushing me in that direction to try to understand how we come up with these problem definitions. And so I think you did put your finger on a very important aspect and we're investigating what are the tools of operations research that can try to help with that direction. Thank you very much. Right. And, and Tracy, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, but first I'd just like to say thank you so much, Chris, this is really, really interesting and and Laura you really hit the nail on the head in terms of my interest um, in trying to understand values from various perspectives like how communities would define success um, in terms of changing processes that's something Chris and Arnoush and I are thinking about all the time so I'm actually just curious based on what I've seen today um, in your experience Chris like how well do people do using this sort of simple decision making tools that they've employed for decades in these complex industrial settings like like I think of the airlines that we're working with North Star and how they they really schedule on the fly and change every every hour. Um, you know, when you compare that. I know we haven't done that with North Star, but when you compare existing processes uh, with new tools for problem solving, you know, how do people do, especially people in these sort of low resource contexts? Yeah, so, so I guess that there's, there's two answers. One answer is if you take, you know, the a scheduling problem like that job shop scheduling problem I showed you without the uncertainty, humans are terrible at it. Um, they don't, they do a very poor job. They don't even know they're doing a poor job. And it's much easier for, for uh, computers to come up with a solution, but that's assuming that we have a well-defined optimization criteria, we have a well-defined set of constraints, right? And so as we're moving into, for example, the dynamic scheduling that you talked about, where there's all sorts of uncertainty, there's things happening in the world, an optimal solution is only optimal to the extent that the world continues along with the assumptions that you've made, right? And so if the world does not match your assumptions, the value of having an optimal solution to begin with is, is kind of questionable. And so it moves into these areas where we're trying to do dynamic problem solving. We can, you know, maybe in retrospect, look at what happened and evaluate how good we were in responding to the things that happened. And maybe there are tools that we can have over the long term that help us to respond better or not. But in many cases, the, the complexity of what's going on is actually filtered through some of the experience of the people. Right, and, and my guess is that you know, as you get into these more complicated problems, people actually start doing better and better um, at making these decisions. Even if we're talking about a well-defined, you know, minimize your cost function, right? When you start getting into areas that are fuzzy, where we're talking about, you know, what is good for a northern community in terms of the service of an airline, um, we're not even sure what. We're trying to optimize to begin with and so the ability of someone to optimize an unknown function is you know it, it doesn't really matter <laughs> in some senses right and and so I'm, I'm kind of embarrassed about my technology because you know i try to understand is it actually relevant to these really complex human-centered problems and can we make it relevant because there are some underlying mathematical difficulties but sometimes it seems to be so far away from those real problems that I'm trying to find a path to connect the two of them. 
Yeah, it does. But but it, I'll just reinforce what I put in the chat, but I'm astounded at how little effort seems to have gone into those solutions as yet um, in Northern context, but also sort of in context, I think we'd be surprised at how, you know, transportation companies and food processors, and you know, they still rely on these these sort of intuitive human-based systems to a large degree, I think. Now, the, the most popular optimization tool is Excel, which is not, <laughs> which is not an optimization tool, right? <laughs> Okay, um, am I unmuted? Yes, I am. Okay, well, um, unfortunately we're out of time. I think these were really, A, it was a really fascinating presentation and I think really good questions as well. Um, certainly things that uh, relate to uh, issues that I've been wondering sitting through this talk as well. So, um, but Chris, thank you so much. I look forward to continuing this discussion with you. And uh, yes, congratulations. <laughs> and um, I look forward to seeing all of you in future presentations. So just a reminder that next week we will have, uh, I, I hope I'm not mispronouncing the name here, but Luis Martin Rousseau, uh, again, talking about improving the efficiency of cancer treatment through predictive and prescriptive analytics. Um, but, uh, and again, a lot of great uh, talks coming up. So please take a look at our schedule. Uh, again, thank you very much, Chris. Um, a lot to think Thanks, about. Thanks everybody. Looking forward to it moving forward. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.